nickname was Red Sonia. She lived in a savage world in an age of violence. His name was Calador. No man could beat him. No sword could stop him. I'm a mercenary. Nobody pays me. And if I think somebody owes me something, I take it. The wicked Queen Gedron determined to rule the world. So this can make worlds. Or shatter them by a storm and earthquake. The talisman has terrible power. Which grows in the light. The talisman, Sonia. Send it into darkness. Swear that you will. I swear. Together, Sonia and Calador ride to battle the forces of evil. We must find the talisman. Only I can touch it, remember. You take that way, I'll go the other way. Get run! Where are you? Majesty, the talisman is almost beyond control. We must bury it in the dark before it is too late. It will be buried, but I have no further use for it, and that time is not yet. But it will kill us all! Oh, God, Majesty, what do you want? The world, Michael! Madness. There will be no world. Brigitte Nielsen. No man may have me unless he has beaten me in a fair fight. What about right now? And commandos Arnold Schwarzenegger in Dino De Laurentiis's Red Sonja. The woman and the warrior. Together, they made a legend. Hey, now everybody, welcome to a special episode of the Movie Mavericks podcast. I'm Trevor Anderson. Send you over to Jason Rugard. He's got a rundown for us. On tonight's episode, it's a bit of a companion piece to an episode a few back, which we talked about the Conan Chronicles, the 4K release of the Schwarzenegger classics the first two Conan movies, or I guess the only two Conan movies. These are the sister... No, there's a third, remember? Uh, Is there? The remake. Oh, right, yeah, with Jason Momoa. Don't forget the remake. I I think Momoa wants to forget the remake, even. Uh, Although I think, in hindsight, it's aged a little bit better than... And I'm a little less hard on it, knowing what it is and and the limitations of it than when I first saw it. I'm I'm full hard on it. Uh, Yeah, you do have a hard on for it. Completely hard. And I think that this two movies that we're going to talk about tonight, these these are actually companion pieces in that they're sister films, they're spinoffs, they're semi-sequels. We're talking about Red Mm Sonja, the Brigitte Nielsen star with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the co-starring role, even though they sold it with his name above the title. And we're also going to be talking about Call the Conqueror with Kevin Sorbo. So another dual episode. But first, let's talk about Red Sonja. When did you first see this movie? Do you recall how you first came to Red Sonja? VHS. Rental at home, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually saw this in a theater. It's one of my earliest movie-going memories. Mm. And I recall this because my dad was getting a hernia operation. And we went to the hospital afterwards and visited him. And... On the news in the room, they showed the weekend box office results, and that was the first time I became aware of not only box office results, but that they that they posted yeah, them, like that it was like news yeah. to anybody. And that's you know, there's very few things I remember about the, the theatrical experience of this movie. There's two parts specifically uh-huh. that are in my mind. One is in the very beginning when they throw those ladies down that tomb, and they're stuck in there. It freaked me out. And when the guy gets crushed by the rolling door. I don't know why those stick out in my head, but that's the only two things I remember of this movie. Yeah. Oh, and I remember the audience laughing at Schwarzenegger when he says to her, that's logic. When she says that I can only have a man. I remember the audience laughing right. at that and thinking, oh, that, that, that must be, I didn't really understand what that meant as a six-year-old kid, but uh, I begged my mom to take me to see who, this. Who does understand it now? This movie is very cheap, right? Well, it's definitely the worst of the true Conan movies, even if you want to call us a true Conan movie. I mean, look, it has two returning characters, right? Sandal Bergman's in this. She plays the evil character. That was the lover from the original Conan the Barbarian movie. Valeria. Yeah, exactly. And then you have Schwarzenegger returning, not as Conan, though, though as Kalidor, whoever the fuck that is. And Richard is. Fleischer, who directed Conan the Destroyer. Who directed the sequel, yeah, is now here again for the third outing. And... I don't know how much of this is, does this exist just because Schwarzenegger was probably, you know, well, he was contractually obligated maybe in some way, right? Or felt obligated to, to appear in this because he was technically supposed to be in several other actual Conan movies. That's why we're, we're going to be talking about Cole the Conqueror. We'll, we'll get to that later. But um, he was, that was supposed to be a, a Conan movie. And so this as well uh, being a spinoff, I mean, he must have just kind of 
been in it to be in it, but he didn't want to be Conan. It's weird. And if we're talking about like movies that come out today, this is such a Mary Sue movie for by today's standards. Like the opening of this movie is just, hi, you're Red Sonia. You're a girl. So you're fucking awesome here. Let me give you special powers and go start the movie. And then that's how the movie starts. So she doesn't start. She doesn't train. She doesn't do anything. She's just automatically amazing. She inherits a power basically like a superhero from a God. Yeah. But, but she does it because specifically because she's a woman. Right. I mean, that's even the, the goddess that gives her the power says that. So it's very like, and this is something that we didn't question back. I don't even question when I watch it now, but it's just something in context for today's like culture war bullshit nonsense. But this is, it definitely like, I see this through that lens now because it's fucking ruined everything. It's, it's just weird to see that even, you know, what is this like 40 years ago? Yeah. 85, 30 years ago. Oh. I mean, a long time ago to see that kind of a thing. And it wasn't a big deal back then. Like you say, people watched it, people laughed at it. I watch it. It's a perfectly fine movie. Brigitte Nielsen is hotter than hell in this. I would love to have seen more Red Sonia movies, to be honest with you. I thought this was a perfectly serviceable movie. Again, I didn't see it in theaters, but this would be a great, like, straight-to-video stuff, I thought. Big, uh, big video rental. This hit most people on video or cable. I think Schwarzenegger said that he was, his story, at, when it bombed, of course, is that he was asked to come on and shoot a few days, but then they went and sold his name above the title. But I don't buy that either because he's in a lot of this movie. It's more than just a yeah. few days on but set. But he leaves for, he, but he's not in like a lot of the big set pieces and stuff, to be fair. And a lot of the stuff that she does in this is almost a mirror of what happens in the second Conan in uh, the destroyer that people like now, but now it's like her kind of doing it instead of him. And he, even when he does show up, he's kind of on the outside, like watching her do everything. And this one feels to me more like a video game setup where she's kind of going along. She has to defeat like certain bosses and things like this. I thought the destroyer kind of had that feeling, but this one definitely has that type of a, of a progression to it. It's definitely under the other two. I mean, in, in terms of the story. Story-wise, and yeah. The, the ambitions of the film. And for me, when it opens up and there's no opening narrator, it's just a scroll. It just feels instantly cheap. And there's that underlying supernatural element that you spoke of where, like, a sorcerer gives her her strength and then, like, you know, it blesses her arm as the greatest sword arm, but then later guides her into what sword to pick, but then is never to be heard of or seen from again. It's this weird supernatural element that's kind of running through the film because there's our magicians and sorcerers, but who uh-huh. is that? Like, who's guiding her? Some some just fairy godmother? The beginning of the movie is she's, like, gang-raped, right? I, I mean, they don't show this. Is it her family this. that's She's gang-raped, left for dead, and her family's her? killed, and so she's... I thought it was uh, the, the lady who introduced... Who's talking to her? I thought that they introduced themselves as a goddess of some sort. Am I wrong about that? I, I didn't Do I, pick am that I misremembering up. I, that? It has to be. It reminds me of you know, the, the sorceress of Eternia when I'm hearing it. That's what I'm imagining in my fucking mind. I mean, it is just a female spirit uh, thing or something. But maybe in my mind, I assumed it was like a goddess because this is like the time period for like gods and stuff. Even though the gods never even in the first two movies never really showed themselves you know it was mostly men like channeling powers and gods instead of gods themselves and this one's like the actual god or spirit itself actually giving her something uh, it's kind of weird it doesn't fit with a lot of the rest of the movie but this movie is kind of a hodgepodge of scenes some that work some that don't some that have a great production design some that have unfortunate production design I think this is one shade from crossing the line to becoming one of those Italian cheapy knockoffs that arrived in the wake of the Conans. Mm-hmm. These, this isn't much better than the Conan knockoffs that followed, and I'm talking about Sword and Sorcerer, Beastmaster, those. The only novelty was putting a woman front and center here. Do you think that this looks very good? Well, the bad, the woman's a bad guy too, right? So there's two... Woman versus Which woman, I like that right? they don't have a male as the head bad guy here. I do like mm-hmm. that it's female versus yeah. female. She's good in the... Well, actually, I actually think everyone's cast well in this, including the little Asian... Ernie Reyes Jr. Prince Tarn and... Uh, Ernie Reyes Jr., yeah. And, of course, Falcon, yeah. And the score to this movie, that Ennio Morcone score, I think that gives this film, this movie, a, a kind of a grandeur that it doesn't actually have or doesn't show up on screen but that music adds so much when Schwarzenegger's galloping along and it's playing or they're sword <laughs> fighting and it's kind of this kind of enchanting music 
Yeah, it really just adds something to this movie that I wish the rest of it had because there are sequences where it's that sword fight between Schwarzenegger and Nielsen is very well handled and is about the best choreographed thing in the whole movie because there's a couple other fight scenes, particularly when she fights the guy who has, owns the toll road, that bride tag, and splits him open. That's not handled mm-hmm. well at all. That just people lunging at each other, which is kind of a letdown. Oh, yeah. I mean, when Schwarzenegger goes to the temple, that seems oddly cheap to me. But and I always wondered what happens when they get thrown into the middle of the temple there. They seem like they're still alive. I think they're being crushed, Then they close right? the top. Do they close the top, or does the whole thing crush them? I never understood it. It scares the shit out of me as a kid. I don't know why. It must be because that was like my first form of claustrophobia sh- showing up, because the idea of being trapped in the bottom of that well with no air or light, just, it, duh. Right? It freaked me out when I was a kid. Those kind of things you remember as a kid watching a movie, the shit that scared you, right? But the story itself has the orb that can control, can only be touched by a woman. It has this sword and stone uh-huh. aspect where only certain people can touch it. And it seems like when they have, when the, the bad lady, Sandal Bergman, has this kind of virginal underling touch it first, it reminded me of the Conan the Destroyer story that had the virgin person who had could only put the horn on the dragon and... That seemed like a little bit of a crossover there between the two. But I did like that only women can touch the orb. And that's why um, mm-hmm. it was needed and Sonya was needed and why the, the female henchman or bad guy was necessary to the story. Yeah, it's nice to have it. For after two movies that were uh, very masculine, and this, not that this movie's super feminine, but, uh, but it's nice to have to see like a, an all-female version of this i guess i don't know even though it's not as good maybe they could have done a lot more work on the story i still find it interesting i think that as well the the effort that went into the movie went into the the sets, the sets. Are good i was gonna still, say right the I mean, are they not great first yeah. of all let's talk about a couple of them you noticed the squatting buddha correct where it's when she's doing the sword training the buddha uh-huh. looks like he's taking a shit i mean siskel and ebert brought yeah. that up in their review too <laughs> That moment in movie history between the introduction of horseback riding and the obsolescence of the brass brassiere, known as sword and sorcery. <laughs> Our first movie is named Red Sonia, and this one gets the prize against some very tough competition as the single silliest sword and sorcery movie since the Black Shield of Thalworth. This one is so inept, there are times when it's actually fun, especially when the actors struggle through dialogue that sounds like they've already read the Mad Magazine parody of this film. The movie stars Bridget Nelson as Red Sonia, a woman warrior who embarks on a crusade to avenge the terrible deeds done to her by an evil queen. And in this scene, Arnold Schwarzenegger turns up to demonstrate that she'll never walk alone. Watch out, Sonia! <laughs> Look out, Watch Sonia. out, Sonia! I just love that. Later on, they fall in love, which is a little complicated, since she has taken a vow never to love a man who cannot defeat her in battle. And, as Arnold argues, not unreasonably, if he defeats her in battle, there's not going to be much left for him to love. <laughs> I know. It's been a long time since I've heard a line like, you're mad, the talisman will destroy you. Meanwhile, they're dropping dirt directly, directly. in front of the limb. <laughs> exactly. you know, right there, it's inches away from the camera. It's supposed to be falling on them. <laughs> you know what I saw when I saw that scene? I think, you know what? If they'd only had plastic surgery back then in the Middle Ages, the movie would have been over. But how about her sister, my brother, my family? That, it, not only did she wipe out her family, but she yeah. also killed her sister and her brother. Yeah, but they were vermin. And that's really going to. There were times <laughs> during this whole movie when it was so ridiculous that I really did think it might be a satire of sword and sorcery movies, just like Airplane took on Airport. I love that line that they have in the movie. Yeah. If you want to be a great swordsman, you must have a great sword very thoughtful. Also, the way the movie respects the single greatest unwritten law of sword and sorcery movies, which is that when the hero is surrounded by three dozen enemies, they always come at him one at a time. They get in line once at a time so he can pick him off instead of they could all just jump on him and kill him, which of course they never do because then the movie would be over, which would be too much to hope for. Oh, of <laughs> and my favorite moment, I guess, but see, well, I, don't, I didn't for a minute believe this was unintentionally funny. I thought this was just bad movie making, okay. to be clear about well, that. Well, it's a thin line. No, no, I say that when you take a figure, a religious figure like a Buddha, and you place him, and this was, I mean, I don't mean any disrespect, but I wonder how you're going to be able to describe this. Well, let's put it this way. The Buddha in this film that they have near the camp looks like... <laughs> 
How does he look, James? <laughs> the Buddha looks like Now we know why he looks so contented, right? <laughs> Oh, I guess you got to see the movie. I don't, no, I don't want to say that because I don't, don't see the movie. The Buddha looks like he's going to the bathroom. Thank you very much. Coming up next to the movies, our next film. <laughs> Even better to me, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when, when Schwarzenegger brings Nielsen to where her dying sister is, the dying sister mm-hmm. is basically hiding out underneath this fossilized I animal know, mounting awesome. another animal. It's basically butt fucking <laughs> this other animal. Well, there's a lot of sex in this movie, or uh, rather, like w- women being having the strength to like rise up against, I guess, the harsh reality of being a woman during this time. Like she herself, I was like, the movie opens with, and they're like, it's like you were gang, like you just got gang raped and shit. Like it's just like a horrible like uh, opening. Whereas like we saw like that kind of an opening in the Conan movie. Um, but here they describe it, and because they're not showing it, I guess they're able to describe it worse than like they would be able to well, show it. They also it. wanted that PG know, rating, but... so they couldn't show it. They could just kind of show a quick flashback. I guess, but it's way worse, right? Like this is a way more harsher world than either of the either the Barbarian or Destroyer. It feels like it's harsher to be a woman in this time. I mean, Valeria was That's at least I mean, a yeah. very competent, so she wasn't a victim at all at any time. Whereas Sonya starts out a victim and then becomes a warrior, so it's a bit of a different. But her. Not by her doing, though. That's what I always... Yeah, I don't that's like true. That I agree, because he didn't forge her. They should have given her the ability to, to rise up for herself, rather than just giving it to her. And I did like that a couple of the shots in here. There's like a, a nice Kurosawa homage when they're doing that sword fighting scene with the the Asian character, you know, the grandmaster. There's kind of an Asian flair in there mm-hmm. for no reason. They're taking all these different genres, the medieval, um, the samurai, and kind of throwing the prehistoric, throwing them. I love when they have to cross the bridge, and it's that dinosaur that's died, and the fossils have created a bridge for her to walk on. Um, that, mm-hmm. that, that kind of shit, that kind of world building reminds me of stuff that, you know, they would have done that with CG now. It's what it's a matte painting obviously back then or some sort of miniature and it just works so well in the moment and i think that's the kind of movie magic that i'm looking for from something of this era of this type what doesn't work at all is the screaming mechanical shark hippo monster (laughs) that they have to fight which is a big portion a huge sequence of this movie probably the biggest action sequence of this movie and it it didn't work when i was a kid it was goofy and it's fucking terrible now i mean it is so cheap it looks like it's on a track like the jaws ride got to pull out the eyes and when it does it goes like wah 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 (laughs) like a radio that's on the bad station it's fucking terrible And where does Kalidor come from, which is uh, Schwarzenegger's character? He just I wanders where, into Because they're in that cave or whatever. Yeah, he's, uh, so I guess he came through the entrance. But he's been following know. them from afar, but not meeting up with them. That's what I didn't understand about this, right? Because he's, he's constantly interjecting himself throughout the, the whole travels. And mostly just so he can be like, hey, you want to fuck? But like, pretty much he's just like, so he's always there. So why is he like not there? Why is he not present if he's going to be there all the time? It's weird. It's it's weird because he's a lord in this too. So he's not a barbarian. He's actually yeah. Well, he's not Gandalf the fucking wizard. Like I gotta go fly over here and do this other shit, and I'll be back. You know, check on you in a while. But uh, that's what he acts like. But why? He's just on a fucking horse. Well, he's her shepherd for some reason. He decides that this lady who is the the greatest swords person to ever survive needs some sort of. Well, he's her uh, yeah. companion. He's her equal, and she has to learn that men are still there's still good men out there, right? And so he's that good man that's gonna show her that. Which is again another weird thing about that this is movie. weird about this movie. Uh, and that that sequence, like I said, where the audience laughed, where she said, "I can, you know, you can only have a man after he's tried to kill you," and, and he said, "That's logic." Right. And that's a nice little bit of writing in there. This is nicely directed by Richard Fleischer, who's an absolute pro. Started doing, you know, Vikings, uh, the old Vikings movie with Kirk Douglas, Midway, to just name a few, and Conan uh, Part Two, The Destroyer really is a professional director classical director you're not going to get a lot of frills here but everything's static you know a lot of moving camera but tells a story with with this camera i mean i don't have a problem at all with how this is directed i have a problem with a few of the choices made for costumes which i think border on the ridiculous and um some of the sets you know and you bought this on is it 4k or is it just hd it's just hd i don't i don't believe there's a 4k Oh, no, there is actually a 4K transfer of this, but it's only in Europe. Um, and the one we have is just the 
Well, I mean, it's beautiful though. You can see the grain. I mean, it just, just it looks, great, looks yeah. great. But you could also see some of the, the kind of, I don't know if they were jokes that the artists put in to themselves and didn't think anyone were going to catch because it was going to be on a screen so quickly or on a blurry home video screen so small. But uh-huh. some of those, you know, castles and stuff, they have like faces etched into them. Did you notice this? And like they're smiling and making goofy faces when they're, Yes, I mean, some of the stuff's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, other parts are like that sliding snail door that they entered the, the temple in. I loved the way that looked. Um, and I don't know, but other parts, I mean, the, this kid's fucking kingdom that's been destroyed. It seems like this throne room is just yeah, everything a, a looks chair. like a uh, Yeah, everything looks like a fun set yes. to be on. It all looks fake as fuck, but it looks... I don't know. It's just, it's real. It just looks like, like they're there. It looks fun. It looks like... It reminds me of the... Uh, I mean, this one, this movie in particular, more than any of the other movies we're talking about, or even Nicole, but this movie reminds me a lot of the Universal yep. Studios uh, Conan yep. the Barbarian show that used to be there, and um, how that looked like, and seeing that in person, these sets, when I watched this movie, I was like, that's kind of what those look, you can tell that shit's fake as fuck, but it is awesome. Oh, yeah, like the foam molding boulders, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly, uh, right? The dinosaur on a track that comes out, does the fire, and then goes back in, you know, that's what that uh, water beast thing reminded me of. But overall, I, I got to say that as a kid, I watched this movie a crazy amount of times. I mean, I was Ernie Ray's age. He's a Bay Area kid. He's from San Jose. Shout out to him. He's got a GoFundMe right now because he's going through a cancer battle, unfortunately. Kino from Ninja Turtles, if you don't know the name, or from the show Sidekicks when we were kids. But I loved that he mm-hmm. was in this movie. Um, I just you know, obviously was a big Schwarzenegger fan. And Brigitte Nielsen, was she ever well cast in this movie? They got that so right. This should have been yeah. a launching pad for her, really, because she does great in this. For what she's asked to do, she does it well. I think she's likable. I think she makes the Red Sonia character likable as well. And like I say, she's she's beautiful, but she's also tall and strong and everything that you would imagine Red Sonia would be. Like, she just... She's and charming in a couple of those scenes with Schwarzenegger. Yes, exactly. She's very, she's extremely likable. And I like their chemistry together, uh, it, particularly in that sequence when they're they're having that little banter. I think that's it's a nice little sequence. I wish uh-huh. the movie had more of that. Yeah, I would have watched more of these if they had made more of them. I would have watched them. I think they could have done perfectly fine uh, making a couple just for the small screen. You know, they don't have to be. Uh, big screen movies. I don't know why this bombed as much as it did. Maybe the stink was on it at the time because Schwarzenegger wanted out of his contract. Well, that's what I think it was. And he was putting bad publicity out about it. But this was in that era post-Terminator where he wasn't doing very well. I mean, this tanked, uh, Raw Deal tanked, and then um, Commando did well. That's right. and, And kind of rebounded him. But these are both like this, the selling of this, if you just look at the poster, um, the selling of this is is, this is bad marketing, right? Or good marketing, I guess, but also bad because this will backfire uh, on you when you do this kind of stuff. If you overpromise on something, and the idea that this is a Conan the Barbarian movie is false and shouldn't have been marketed as such, you know. And Raw Deal is an amazing movie uh, and also a pile of shit. So I get why no one likes that. Also movie. mismarketed, I think. It's got a very boring poster. But I believe as well, mismarketed too, yeah. But also just not a very, not a big movie. You know, Raw Deal is a small movie, um, but it's fucking awesome. Raw Deal has an amazing suit-up sequence where he gets his guns out, uh, together like he's, he's going to fuck Raw shit up. Raw Deal is one of the most overlooked awesome. movies in the entire Schwarzenegger canon. I mean, it, it's unfairly 100%, overlooked. 100%, yeah. Um, not, you know, some of this, like movies like Junior, I can't stand. Kindergarten was not very good. Kindergarten Cop, watch that recently. Raw Deal is worth another look. Do you want to go ahead and uh, wrap up Red Sonia? You want to give me any last thoughts on this? It's an interesting movie. I, I think it's well worth watching. Like I say, I, I bought it digitally. I didn't buy the Blu-ray. I think maybe along down the line, I might get the 4K because it, it does look really beautiful. Um, you know, these, some of these old source, like, what are these? These are sword and sorcerer. Yeah. Movies, sword really. and sandals. Um, some of these older sword and sword and sorcerer movies are, uh, are really great and great looking. Some of them, not so much, but this is one I think that's what that's well worth watching. Um, especially just for the journey alone, you know, that, that she goes on that physical journey and physically being there nowadays, this would be all green screen. 
No good. It, nowadays, it would just be an action movie or a superhero movie. These used to be called action adventure because somebody actually physically got off yes. their ass and, you go on and an they went on an adventure yeah. and they were changed by the journey. For all the things you just explained, like there's a lot of movement in this, people going places. That's funny you say that. I was, I was watching them do that sword scene. I thought, man, they're burning a shitload of calories every day on this fucking movie. I mean, they are moving about, <laughs> jumping around, and I mean, you got to be physically fit to be doing these movies, and uh, they both are. Yeah. We used to go, you know, they used to go across the kingdom, right? I think that's why people liked... Um, the Lord of the Rings movies was like that. Uh, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, but also Game of Thrones, um, where you traveled. And those, and that was a lot about physical travel of groups of people, that whole show was. Um, and yeah, it adds a lot to it. It, it. it immediately gives you a world to traverse. Which is good. I like that. Red Sonja premiered June 28th, 1985. One year, one weekend, to the, or a year to the weekend of Conan the Destroyer's premiere. Opened up very, very low. Ultimately grossed less than $8 million at the box office. It equates to about $20 million in today's dollars. End to the franchise before it even began and signaled the last major film that uh, Dino De Laurentiis would be involved in. Before his uh, untimely death. So I guess it was timely because he was in his late 80s. But this was definitely the souring of the relationship between Schwarzenegger and De Laurentiis, who had given him his start in the business and ultimately shelved any Conan films that we would get in the aftermath. So now, all these years later, Schwarzenegger says he wants to do a King Conan, and we could have gotten those. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, done. that, that's not that ship sailed a long time ago. <laughs> that's done. We're getting a second season of FUBAR. Yay. Which only a Schwarzenegger asked Can't for. Can't wait. I mean, I, honestly, as a Schwarzenegger fan, both of us. Ugh, I didn't even make it through the first likewise. season. I got the first three episodes down, and I said, I'm good. Ugh. Yeah, I'm not interested at all. I'm as interested in that True Lies show that was on as I am in FUBAR. I know. I forget that's a thing. Yeah. Did you remember that? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue here, forgetting. Here, do you remember that Mr. and Mrs. Smith has been rebooted again? No, exactly. I'm done. Yeah, I know. They have that TV show, that one, too. No, I'm good. I'm good. Exactly. I, mean, I just, I, I've seen the movie. It's a great movie. I, why do I want to revisit that? I don't even want a sequel to that movie. <laughs> why? Why do I need a world? A, a TV show is going to create a world out of that. Why do I want And they couldn't that? make the first version of that TV show work with Jordana Brewster and Martin Henderson, and now they got another version with uh, Donald Glover. So yeah. I guess on Amazon, though, you can subsidize these shows, and they can keep pushing them. Wait, there was a... There was yes, a, there was wait, a Jordana what? Brewster, Martin Henderson show that lasted maybe three episodes. There was a Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Smith? I, I, I would almost bet my life on it. Or a, a like one? I think it was literally called Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It was on CBS or really? NBC. Yeah, this is probably 10 years ago. It's funny. I mean, that sounds like CBS or right. NBC. <laughs> Do you see that being advertised on Sunday Night Football? Yes. I, I already, I just, I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ugh. All right, let's move on and talk about the 1997 Universal release, Cull the Conqueror. As a soldier, he rocks. As a king, he rules. Fanara! As pure as virgin snow. We've met. She's not that pure. But his choice of a bride leaves something to be desired. My queen! Join me, and the earth shall be our empire. She's the incarnation of evil itself. Your bride is over 3,000 years old. She said she was 19. And stopping her is going to take more than a divorce. What are you doing? I can't take a man's life. Now you tell me? Kill him. The queen's name! Lay down your arms! Lay down yours. And then we'll rule together. Traitor! Kevin Sorbo, star of Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, is called. Call the Conqueror. This is, in all intents and purposes, the lost Conan movie because this script started out as a Conan film and transmorphed into a Kevin Sorbo vehicle based on the popularity of Hercules, which was just soaring at the time. I mean, he couldn't have been bigger. He's probably one of the biggest television stars outside of George Clooney or, or you know, one of these name actors that went on to be a movie star. But he had his chance at movie stardom with this movie 
And he had a stroke afterwards, which would derail him starring in Black Dog, which is supposed to be the second film of his two-picture deal with Universal. So this was his one-and-done chance, really, at big screen stardom. I have a bit of a complicated relationship with this movie in that I know it's not very good, but I just have an odd spot for this movie. I've seen it way too many times for how bad it is. Uh, I bought it. I put it on our, our Voodoo account, so we both can not watch it for years to come and then enjoy it on occasion. But what do you think about this movie? I mean, I've already seen... Hey, look, I've seen this movie several times. I saw this movie a couple years ago. I rewatched it already, so happy enough to revisit it now. I'm, I'm right with you on this. I This is a dog shit movie that I quite enjoy. Um, and it's a two-part movie, and um, I really like the first part a lot better where he becomes king. He's the barbarian. He becomes king. He's fucking around becoming king. Then they start introducing like the problem with that, and then they remove him from the throne, and then you have the second half of the movie. And it's at that point that I think, okay, this is <laughs> where are we going with this, guys? Let's fucking wrap this shit up. Um, you know, let's kill Ty Carrera here and, and, and get along with our lives. But, uh, but I still think it's a a fun movie. It's a fun entry into this, and it is in the Conan universe still, even though it's not Conan and it's Cole, and it feels. Conan y to me. Does it not? I mean, it totally does. I don't like the the whole uh side thing with the with the bad I don't like the bad guys in this, I guess. It's my, one of my main issues with this. Um and there's two sets of them. There's like the king's what is he like the nephew or something? He's like the king. He's like the king's like like he's like guy, the natural like, heir he's like, and then they're like the Yeah, like the guy. He's like the, the guy, right hand you know? man. And then you had the wizard guy with uh, the the witch and shit, and it's just like that's like a whole lot of nothing going on there for me. And I always felt like there's a big, like the the movie opens with with Sorba with Cole and the the air guy fucking around like fighting like like Cole's trying to join the army, and that dude just like lays him out. It's like fucking like we don't that's we don't Thomas have Thomas Iron Who the fuck for are you? you Cobra Kai fans out there? That's uh, the guy from yes, Karate and Kid. he's like you know we we only go with like you know true bloods here you know we don't we don't want you what What are you like some fucking barbarian dude we don't do that you're not sophisticated enough for us and then and it feels like like halfway through the movie and this dude's like still like they're still like button heads and stuff through the whole movie and it feels like why don't they why doesn't at some point that dude not like turn around and realize oh this dude's actually a good king like we should be butters and it should become a fucking buddy. oh man you just rewrote a better movie than that's on screen here dude why does that not happen i want that to happen every time i watch this movie because that dude's awesome. And it's Thomas Ian Griffith. Like you know he could be ass. badass on screen, too. And they've yes, he already is set badass. up that he's... In the movie, he's fucking they've awesome. They've already set up like, he's better than Cole. I want that Cole. dude to turn good. I mean, he, in the opening scene, he bests Cole, so, uh, Cole, so it makes sense. That's yeah. what I mean. So they should be buddies, right? Like, Because in because later on, like Cole should be able to like kick his ass. But then they're like, all right, cool. Like It's good. Like We fucking we both beat each other's ass. Like Now we're good. Let's fucking take care of this uh, kingdom here. Uh, I don't know. That to me would be a way better fucking movie than what we got, which is just uh, descends into madness and just it goes on and on without much of a point, you know, or maybe too simple of a point. Very low know. stakes, ultimately. Uh, I know that the end of the world, but it just feels like this is all just kind of a lark, uh, anyways. And let's let's rewind. How did you see this movie for the first time? Oh, VHS. Yeah, once again, VHS. Me, me as well, because. Uh, I had the opportunity to see this in the theater. I, I'll never forget this because I saw a terrible movie instead. Uh, my younger cousin, so I'm probably, I'm 18 when this movie comes out, and I'm basically babysitting my younger cousin. He's 14, and we're going to the movies, and we see the opportunity to see this or the movie we eventually saw, which was Shaquille O'Neal's Steel. Remember that movie? Yeah, <laughs> I saw that in a movie theater yes. instead of this, and I don't know which one I'm better off having Interesting. seen because those are like two of the biggest bombs <laughs> uh, of that year. They're they're probably. About I think evil. they got sold the same amount of tickets, so um, I don't know if I was better off or worse having seen this. But I caught this on Laserdisc, I believe, when it came out, rented it, and immediately mm-hmm. was underwhelmed because of that cheap sounding score. I mean, talk about that Ennio Morcone. The score yeah. of this sounds TV level and it's got a very confusing opening scroll. It's, it's way too much information that necessarily isn't 
uh, paramount to the plot. I mean, I know they're bringing back the witch and they need to tell you that, but do we really need that opening scroll? I think the movie could have just started. We could have figured out this witch wants to take over the world and, and bring forth. For anyone that's wondering, the guy who did the music to this did a ton of Jerry TV Goldsmith? stuff. <clears throat> uh, Joel uh, Gold- Goldsmith. It's Joel Goldsmith, but he did a bunch of uh, stuff like uh, Witchblade, like a lot of the Stargate TV shows, um, and just stuff like that. So you can you, to get an idea of like, you know, where he is. But I know him best for Laser Blast, doing the music for Laser Blast, which was a Richard Band movie, which is a, a an old like not a full moon movie. I think it might, Empire Pictures, but it's a ridiculous alien fucking uh, cheesy movie. <clears throat> so this dude's been around, but as we say, he's been on a on. A lower level, if you will. I don't do, you, know. do you think it sounds too cheap professional? As well? But yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, but that's what he does, right? Yeah, it's unfortunate. It's cheaper, cheaper stuff. I, I don't think it's bad. You know, it's just it's not rousing. There's no themes here. It's just what it is. It just, it just yeah. kind of yeah, it, it's fine for what it is, and it's got kind of a heavy metal electric guitar. It's a very TV feeling. Like I like I think the. The the biggest thing this guy ever did was Star Trek First Contact, right? Which I had no problems with. But that's when he, yeah. And so this guy's dad is Jerry Goldsmith, right? And so he worked with him on that, though. But that's why that one's a lot better. And Jerry Goldsmith's an absolute legend. I mean, First Blood, to name yes, a few, exactly. Star Trek, so, and that kind of stuff. So there you have it. So I mean, this guy's good, but he's just not. It, that good, I guess I would say. I don't know. I don't have a. I, I agree with you. And did you notice that this that was Sven Ol Thorson as the murderous king? I mean, that the character, first of all, uh, he's yeah. the guy from Conan. I wish he was in this more. He's to be great in this because, he, but I mean, if you think about it, the yeah. way he's playing is kind of comical because he he comes back from the dead. It's almost Monty Python esque. He comes back from the dead. Yeah, I and know. gives Cole. No, no, I want you to be my my successor. Yeah. And the thing is, though, if you think about that scene. It's really dark. He's gone crazy and murdered all of his heirs. He's the mad king. And yeah, I know. It's he's great. I'm like, this is fucking, the, 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 there's no more blood is going to be on the floor tonight. I wanted more of well, that from I, this movie. More of that kind of shit. Yeah, me too. That's why I like the first half of this movie where he's first getting set up and then they're trying to explain like, this is how the kingdom works and everything. But it is funny that Cole just runs right into the fucking throne room. Has no problem. No one yeah, stops him. No, no problem one does. No, the king. they're just like the, the Thomas Ian Griffith character just just stands there and watches him as he like basically kills the king. It's weird. And Thomas Ian Griffith, you know, we keep talking about him. If you don't know, he's a B movie action star. He got he was Terry Crease in Karate Kid Three and Cobra Kai now, but he had a long mm-hmm. history. Wrote and directed a few films. Uh, but he'll have an action star. And whenever I see him in a movie being underused, I always, it's like when I see Scott Atkins in a a level movie, when they don't let him do anything that he's known for in his B movies, like roundhouse kicks or any flips or any of that kind of shit. You think what a fucking waste to have this guy on screen without doing anything electric, but so be it. Exactly. It's like you have Van Damme in your movie. He doesn't do the splits or any sort of dancing. I'm not having it. (laughs) <laughs> Wasting Take the shirt time, off, yeah. put some suspenders on, and move that ass. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, how did John Nicolette get this gig as director? This is a guy who was basically the co-creator of Miami Vice, directed a couple seminal episodes of mm-hmm. that, but doesn't ever have anything on his resume that would suggest he would be the right fit Mm-mm. for this, and I don't know if he is. Mostly TV stuff, though, but but I don't know. What, what level of... We just talked about the, the, uh, the score here. What level of director do they have? A TV movie di- series director. So I don't. This movie sounds like they uh, they just went cheap on it, right? Doesn't it? I mean they, it's, it has Kevin Sorbo. Oh, in it, it has the cheapness of a Hercules so TV this show. Is cheap, yes. It's like a. It's like well. It's like uh, if you had it's like four Hercules TV shows in one. Yeah, with all the plot development. <laughs> that's that's the budget, right? It's like four times the budget of that. Well, and that's all the fucking is. different ways the story goes because it feels like the the tonal of, of this movie is yeah. all over the place. But do you think, or at least I feel, that this is closer to something like the Scorpion King than to Conan, in in aesthetics? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I I know what you mean. Yeah. I mean, this feels like a Conan movie, but um, I guess only because. Of, well, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have the uh, like the the Scorpion King feels like it tried to reach. This movie does not reach for anything. <laughs> well, Scorpion King to me would pander to families. Like, it felt I, like they had the little kid in there. They were 
Well, they made what, like five? I didn't of mean those. the first one though. That they were really pushing towards the family. I understand crowd. that, but that launched a whole thing. This did not. This did none of that. Could have easily though. It could have easily had a straight to video run. Just well, like I don't know. I don't think anyone would have watched. Right up there with the Dark Man <laughs> series on video I mean, shelves. To be fair, like the Mummy was way bigger than Conan. So like going through like the Scorpion King would be. I don't. It just seems like that would be a lot easier to set up and and do a series for rather than Cole the Conqueror, which actually doesn't even mention Conan. Yeah, I feel like it's not in his world for that. I mean, at least the Scorpion King was like part of the Hiberian Age. The mummy yeah, shit, it's it was know? part yeah. of that. Whereas this, they don't even make mention of Conan in here, Red Sonja, or any of mm. that. But um, he does make mention that he was once a pirate, which is what Cole was before he became king, King Cole. Um, another odd thing about this movie, it's the Red Witch, right? She's got red hair. It's what Ty she's Carrera. known. Carrera. How do you say I, I always thought name? it was Tia Carrera, but that's just the way I always said. I know that's what I would have said too, Tia Carrera. That I've been is, saying that but, since 92, so if I'm mispronouncing it, I don't know I'm, if that's I've been right. mispronouncing it for 32 years, so I'm just going to go ahead and stick with that. But why is she cast as the red-haired <laughs> witch when she is a very, very beautiful brunette Asian American actress. I mean, this it seems like that role was written for like a Scottish lady. It's the red headed witch. I mean, yeah. why not just rewrite that as the, the raven haired witch well, or it's something? A, it's a Conan thing, so you're gonna be very like Nordic or uh, Germanic or like European. So it is weird that they would be that she would be Asian, well, I guess. Talk but about the most useless character during that time period. The Indian character. Yeah, but weren't Asians like magical in a way, like for like European stuff like that? I know that sounds super racist, but I just mean like because they were they would be it's different. It's mystical. You know? It's I know what you're talking about. I don't know how it's to just explain like the, it. You know, but that's just how it was. It's back like the then. Kelly Hugh character not, in Scorpion long, King. <laughs> she's what the sorceress. You know, she's the mystic. All that. I, I know what you're getting at. Well, I just don't think it was uncommon for like an Asian. Well, hell, look at the wizard in Conan the Barbarian movie. Yeah, Mako. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just I don't think it was that uncommon for like a magical sorceress or sorcerer to be of Asian descent um, in these types of movies. I just wonder if Universal. Do you know. think that they were watching the dailies and that they were actually happy with these? Well, she was big though. At the I'm time. talking about the actual. She was. Oh, she was fucking as big as she ever was going to be. She was probably. That's what I'm saying. She was probably bigger than anyone else in that in the movie at the time. Yeah, because Karina Lombard, um, uh, the the actress who was the girl Tom Cruise has the affair with in the firm, mm-hmm. she's the quote unquote love love interest here. She's the slave girl who becomes the queen, but. She's kind of a right. non-entity. She doesn't really come across very well, or at least Tia Carrera has some sort of energy in the in the role, and she brings some sort of energy and magic to the film. I, I mean, she, she scores. Yeah, well, I mean, the 90s were so big for her, and especially, I mean, obviously she does Relic Hunter right after this, and that's the end of that. <laughs> um, even though that lasts Way for, too long. I don't know, several, three seasons or something of like that? I don't know. I got to get that series now that I'm talking about it. Um but yeah, I, I don't know. She was always more of just a pretty face than anything else. I, so I don't know. And could Sorbo be any bigger than what he was in 1997? As I'm watching this, I'm thinking, this guy at the time was poised to have no. taken over. I mean, he could have been a viable action star. Well, the movie's just dark Right, but shit. He, he put him in something decent. He had the build. He had the look. He had the fan base. He could have... You know, if, if his health had stayed right and they put him in a, a de- decent vehicle, he could have been something. I mean, it could, could have been a star there. Well, he's not. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's a TV star. I mean, let's be honest at this point. I guess I don't know. I mean, the Hercules stuff was um, all the way up unto this and past this, right? He was in, um, they did some Hercules stuff because he was in like Xena stuff. And crossover say, stuff, yeah. Right? And I think the legendary journeys actually lasted a couple years after this i don't know but regardless of that he i mean he went on to do that andromeda show um which lasts for like five seasons and, and a bunch of like tv a stuff walking tall sequels so he, direct so to dvd this, sequels yeah he did a bunch of, of direct to, to tv movies and stuff there in the 2000s um so i don't know he just never he just always was what he was right he never had a breakout uh performance as far as movies go 
That just never happened. But he was a huge star on TV. You don't think he would have had the chops to maintain a big screen career? Put him in something like The Fugitive or no. Harrison Ford type role? I think he's I no. I think he's super likable. I don't think he emotes very well. He's cold. He's a bit of a cold he, everything fish. Everything seems... Except he's cold with a very warm it's smile. So I, I don't know what to do with him. Like he's very, yeah, like he's very like uh, screen ready. Yeah. He's very like, hi, how are you? Like I'm super nice. You're going to really, you're going to like me and you're going to get to know me, but I'm not really going to sell you on any truly emotional things that I have to do. I'm just going to be this guy, this bright light that you're going to be like, oh, that's, you know, like a moth to a flame, you know? <laughs> like this guy looks pretty cool, but then that's I'm going to give you, you know? a comparison. Well, that's kind of always what it was. But I liked him anyways. I'm watching Andromeda again for the you know sixth time, whatever. At this point, I, I you know I I and like, I like Hercules. I've seen that way too many times. I love the Hercules series, uh, but too, I'm yeah. going to give you a comparison here, and it's not favorable. It doesn't. It's it's not meant to be a put down, but it's a bit of a George Lazenby scenario. Yeah, he looks the part. Yeah. But don't ask too much of him. He has a limited range, but in that range, he's he good great- at what he's doing. Exactly. And he had a great, his Bond movie was better than probably any of the movies that Sorbo ever did. But if you look at him in that movie, in the Honor Magic Secret Service, he is stale as fuck. He's really rigid. Yeah. <laughs> like, ugh, yeah. And they're building a movie around him, uh, around his limitations. But he's likable, I think. Like, he's, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I just wish that this movie had a better is. through line here. Like you said, I'm a big fan of everything that happens in here until he goes under the spell and has to be broken out of the dungeon. Until he gets removed and from I know the it's yeah. an, We were just throne. saying how in Red Sonja we liked that it was an adventure and this person was going from A to B. But, but this isn't this is an a, adventure, No, because right? it's, it's a big chase your tail. I mean, we're just going around in circle to get back to... Yeah, then he has to go to like... I mean, he. I guess he does go on an adventure because right? he goes to like the ice place or whatever. None of that's really effective, though. I mean, because it's just to get back to it's the not, kingdom. It's We're dumb. going in a big circle just to get back to where we started from. <laughs> I know. So they should just stay in the kingdom. They should just had him be the king and deal with the kingdom and deal with like that kind of stuff. Because I was digging that before we started to try to turn this into like, oh, and by the way, we are trying to make a Conan movie. You're like, are you? Because you don't really. Seemed like you got the budget. Well, it, not only that, with, with the shots, like once again, there, where is the creativity here? Things look small. There's, there's yeah. no scale of size. It doesn't look like a, a really a lived in world. It's too clean they, uh, looking. It looks like these are all freshly built sets. Oh, it's horribly shot. Yeah. But when they meet the, when he goes to, when the Thomas Ian Griffith character goes and they're um, you know, going behind Cole's back and then trying to get the, the, Akivasha, you know, the, the evil witch, yeah. sorceress lady and stuff. And he goes and he meets that wizard guy who's burned or whatever. And they go to the gates. Yeah, no, yeah, for scene? sure. Fucking horrible. And how boring is that whole thing? And you just, the whole time, there's several scenes like this where it's just, just people are just talking around. He's like, this isn't Shakespeare. Like, fucking get on with it. What are you guys it's doing? It's just shot scale. Lurking in the shadows. And I hate that fucking guy. Um or that character, I should say, who's burned or whatever, who's constantly there, like, oh, my queen, or whatever. And then she's like, just fucking like, she hates him. She's like, fuck you. Arr! Burns him again. She's like, fuck this guy. And that's a point I can get behind. Yeah, fuck He reminds guy. me of the, the elders in 300. Those like kind of scarred people that are up there that are all kind of pervy and for no reason just licking that oracle's face. You're like, that's what oh, yeah. it reminded me of. He is very much like that, where he's like, oh, my queen, you know, make me look. And then he gets a little too big for his britches. And I'm like, don't let me, you know, you're a little bitch. And immediately pre- preceding that scene is the sequence where Cole breaks out of the dungeon by fighting and then allegedly strangling like that half man, half like ape thing that's in there. What yeah, is what that? Is Why that? is that even in this? What was that all about? Was that just because it's there? Like, yeah. Cause they, cause they, it was a cheap looking fucking costume on top of it, but that none of that exists. That's like some death exactly stalker. Shit, I was going to say, it, that's a great reference for it. It's <laughs> death stalker. Is yep. it not? Well, so were some of the costumes in red Sonia bordered on death stalker. So I thought, well, they had that inconsistent on that's this. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It, well, except there's a huge time difference between this and Red Sonia. Yeah, about 13 years. <laughs> I mean, holy fuck. This is the end of the 90s. Like, this is, um, 
I mean, to say this is like television grade stuff, this is literally, this is like a made for TV movie in the mid, in the late nineties. Yeah. It really got is. released to the big screen with a marketing campaign. And that's probably why they dumped it into the last week of August on Labor Day weekend or wrap out there because they knew that this was not going to ha- draw a big audience. And it didn't. It, it bombed at the box office. It grossed, in adjusted terms, less than $14 million, so even less than Red Sonja made, proving that Schwarzenegger, even in a cameo capacity, was a bigger star than Sorbo in a leading man role. But if this had been the secret, you can see why, if this was being floated around as a Conan film, why Schwarzenegger passed on it, mm-hmm. because this, is, this needed major, major work. And I don't think that they were ever going to get to a place that was going to make any sort of A-level talent happy at the, the, the story, the script, because this would have needed such re- retooling. You could use some sequences, but the whole second half needs to be redone. And I think I like your idea about him teaming up with the first, the captain of the guard awesome. there and just doing a buddy cop movie, basically. That would have been great because both those guys you know, light up the screen, uh, and they would have, they played they well with each other. I thought to, to begin with, and so having that now turned into a camaraderie thing where we're fucking with each other, but we're on good terms would have been fantastic, and would have made it would have given this movie so much yeah, more. They have life. a nice competitive antagonism in the first scene, which is the best part of that first sequence, uh, because that blindfold fucking thing with the fire and then him putting the sword underwater right. and then lunging at him just doesn't work at all it was almost a teaching moment isn't it that's why i always felt like that should have been a callback later uh, yeah or just you know built on like how how did you not build on that like why is this guy all of a sudden he's just evil but like you said i never understood why they didn't just slay cole mm-hmm. right on the kingdom floor for killing their king even if he had done something wrong but yeah that, that little bit of logic gets overlooked very quickly Um, And I'm willing to suspend my logic in this movie, even though I've spent the last 20 minutes bashing it. And I know it's total shit. Like I said, I've seen this movie way too many times for having the quality that it does. But there are aspects of it that I do admire. And I do admire some of the goofier things about it. Harvey Firestein popping up and, you know, made a little ad lib about, you know, I hate Mm -hmm. the smell of fish call and. Um, some of the sets there, that Ice Planet set, even though it's an unnecessary little divergent in the film, it's, 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 cool. it's fun for what it is. And I can appreciate the smallness of the movie on home video. If I had seen this in the big screen, it was an expecting a Conan type movie for how they were advertising it. I would have been very, very disappointed. And this was during that era when Universal was doing a lot of that kind of bait and switching. And they would advertise something and then you get there and you're like, what the fuck is this? Like the quest. I thought I was going to see Bloodsport 2 basically. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And I've I've grown to okay the quest, but it just marketing for Universal. They just were throwing everything at the wall during that era. Yeah. I mean, I agree. This is definitely one of those movies that you have to, you rate low, but like I said, I've seen this, for such a really such a low times. rating that I would give this I've seen this too many times like I clearly enjoy this movie it's dog shit you know I can't and in every way it just is like I if I were to sit down and like really critique this it would just it would be a horrible review of this movie but I don't think it deserves that because I feel like it's an easy watch. I don't know if anyone's done it or if it's even worth anyone's time, but I would love to know that like the deep production problems of this, how the, what the script looked like, if it was changed because of Sorbo, yeah. because of Universal Brass or Nicolette, the director. I wonder if you can even figure that out because there's, there's almost no information. I would in this love movie, to talk to people behind Being that it. nobody gives a shit about it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if he would, I mean, the director obviously passed away just after the movie, um, was made. So I guess, uh, I mean, you could probably talk to Kevin Sorbo. I don't know if he'd want to talk He's, about Cole after all this time. I've, yeah, he, he probably would. I met the guy not too long ago, 10 years ago, and he talked all about the back problems and about Cole, and he talked about, but it wasn't anything that you, that you don't know or anything big, but you easily could have sat there. He'll, he'll talk to you, guaranteed. He's Maybe we'll have to nice. interview him for Movie Mavericks because I would love to know Maybe what could, the story actually. is behind this movie and how we got to this finished product. How many chefs were in the kitchen? Was it a was it a focus group that said they needed reshoots or make things clearer or dumb it down? Because it, it this couldn't be what they all signed on to do. Because unless he was just so happy to jump and Universal said this is what we're doing, this one we're shooting, go. Because um, obviously, well, you don't have a lot of choices. I mean, he 
He's well, they were work, bankrolling right? the TV show too. Well, this is what's and the TV show's on right? hiatus. It probably made sense. And yeah, here's a movie. It's going to come out in theaters. Um, it's very in line with what he's already been doing and what he's known for. It makes a lot of sense. I just can't. I never understood why they couldn't launch another one of these type of films. I mean, the closest thing we got was Gladiator in a sense, but that's a lot more serious. Uh, no, it's not even right. like this at all. That's a sword and sandals. This is like sword and sorcery. Maybe, and we don't get many of these. We got, what, a couple of the Clash of the Titans Similar, but, reboots, and that's about it? I know. I'd love to have one that's done um, correctly. I don't know. They, they. I think that you can't make this movie in today's world. Like, I asked you not too long ago, like, what would it... Would it be okay if you watched a movie and you saw, like, the lightning and electricity effects of, like back in the day <laughs> like if they did that again like in a movie would that be okay because that's what it would take to make one of these. yeah i don't know would it be that kind of a me- well i just watched lisa frankenstein let me tell you the one good thing about that movie is lightning if you need something magical to happen it's just lightning Perfect. guys that's it it's all text. lightning strikes lightning. and people change their bodies let's get back <laughs> to lightning let's just get back to lightning 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 yeah so I, I don't know. I always like those types of effects, um, those rotoscope, like drawn on, you know, handmade, magical effects things. I always thought those were really cool, and we'd have to get back to that because it's too. These are movies that exist in the imagination, like that, as we saw with. They've tried to remake this uh, so, these movies several times. Like John Carter of Mars is essentially one of these, and when it gets too real, uh, it's not good. It's just not good. It loses the the magic entirely. You know, aliens or cowboys versus aliens. I thought was was kind of a similar yeah, it's too glossy uh, uh, one of these as well. But it's too yeah. It's like you can't. Uh, these movies require a level of of shittiness. <laughs> they just do. And if you're gonna gloss it up, it has to be so stylized. It has to be like three hundred or Immortals to really score is for me. Right. Yes, I agree with that. But those aren't even. I don't even consider those. In, in necessarily they're like a genre adjacent you that's know? fair yeah because these are true sword and sandals um if you go back to jason and the argonauts yeah. things like that that's exactly and so i don't think you could I, i'm not sure you could make those anymore unless you're talking about something like lord of the rings which passes but it only passes because it has that world uh building in it and the characters like, ah fuck it those are good movies what, what can i say <laughs> actually i take it all back because those are good but then the hobbit's a bit much but still those are fine so i don't know maybe you could do it and they just um they just write shitty movies or maybe we're gonna see a resurgence because they've been talking about getting that he-man and the masters of the universe movie off the ground for about a decade now and they seem to be making steps to doing that so maybe that'll i don't know what takes them so long, you know i mean they where are they going to set that this time in San Francisco? This time it's not in LA. Yeah, it's going right? yeah, to be modern day San Francisco. Okay, San Francisco. And, uh, modern day yeah, San Francisco. He's going to be yeah. an Uber driver, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's where eternity takes place. So <laughs> we just cracked right? the story hmm. on Masters of the Universe. Sony, you can thank us. We'll expect our residual checks in the mail. Anything else you want to say about Cole the Conqueror before we wrap up on this uh, companion piece to Conan? No, just Cole Rocks, you know, that's that's the tagline of the movie. Oh <laughs> my god, I can't believe you said Cole Rocks. I recall those T V spots that would say that. They had like that <laughs> that heavy metal, the generic heavy metal music over the trailer. You're like, Oh, stop it. I remember there was an era from about the mid nineties to the early two thousands, probably two thousand four, when any action film directed at guys seemed to have like a couple chords from like a heavy metal song that yeah. was kind of indefinable mm-hmm. on it for some reason. You're like, okay, what, what is that? You know, it was almost like you're watching the promos of a yeah. UFC fight in the early days. It was that, and uh, I didn't mind so much the hip hop stuff that they that they tried to add, but those were only with certain. Yeah, but I've been telling you, any any action film, it felt like it was a couple. Scorpion I, King yeah, too did the same thing. It's not any different, I guess, than today, is it? With a one note, <laughs> uh, and then everything sung a cappella. They, yeah, everything's the same fucking thing nowadays. I guess it was the same back then. I don't know what works. I guess it works, but I agree with you. This movie had—I don't even know why they did that with this. It makes no sense. Cole rocks, does he? Like, does he need a guitar? What's yeah, they have a Cole slays. I mean, that would have been a little bit fucking better than Cole rocks. Then you get Slayer into the soundtrack. You see him with one of those, one of the Metallica fucking guitars and shit, just yeah, shredding that it. Yeah, the music video. He's just walking up behind them. Is that he just cuts their sword in half and shit, like it's in the UHF skit, Conan the Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, there's a, uh, what was that movie called? There's a, uh, 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 um, I'm not gonna remember what the hell it was. Uh, it was like Son of, of Rambo? Uh, something. No, 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 no. There's an Australian, uh, movie that's similar to this type of stuff. It's like a post-apocalyptic type thing, I think. Um, and it's, uh, it's like a metal movie. <laughs> it just reminded me of I'm gonna fucking check it out. Sounds awesome. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what the fuck that movie's called. That wasn't that but... Wolfhound movie, was it? Or no, 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 no. It's called like Son of um of something. Here, let me let me. I mean, you talk about a sword it. and sorcery <laughs> film with a heavy metal <laughs> edge. I mean, now I'm just fucking too intrigued to let this go. Uh, Son of Steel that sounds awesome. Uh, yeah, I haven't watched it yet. I've seen the trailer and it looks clearly not awesome. steeled on. Though, um, it's with from the uh, Swayze movie. It's from no, 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 no. That's you know. I mean, that's good too, but uh, this is from 1988, and it's a futuristic action-packed adventure. Uh, it takes place in Sydney, Australia. As a rock star and a man of peace is trapped by the fascist government and accidentally transported into the future to witness the results of nuclear devastation. His grim discovery that he is directly responsible leads him to travel back from the future to save mankind from destruction. So it's Bill it and sounds Ted. like gore or outlaw of gore. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah it's Bill and Ted. Um, I don't know. It looks awesome. I, I did buy this not too long ago. So I do have the blue. Well, I'm going to expect a review from you for the next episode, please. Um, uh, I want to know what that's right. right. Um, what well, just reminds me of this? Like if, if Cole had a fucking was shredding on the on the base, the electric guitar, slapping the base on the base, <laughs> slapping the base. Yeah, <laughs> Cole slaps movie. his base. They could have put together a band. <laughs> Yeah, it, him and Thomas Ian Griffith could have been in a fucking band in this <laughs> The movie. New Barbarians is the fucking perfect name. <laughs> the New Barbarians. I think that's an actual band, actually, from the 70s. This is yeah, yeah, exactly. awesome. that's, that's why I was <laughs> All right, well, that's going to wrap up our episode tonight. We want to thank you guys, as always, for joining us on these looks backs. We'll be back with you next week with ep- reviews of new movies. And check out our, all of our old reviews. On MovieMavericks.com, check out our old episodes on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever else you're getting this podcast. Speaking for Trevor Anderson, I'm Jason Rugard, and we are the Movie Mavericks. Oh my, another magnificent episode has come to an end. If you're craving more, set your destination to MovieMavericks.com, Warp 9. Engage! Engage!